Man. Well, that's a good job, man. That's a good job. Man. Yeah, chewing that bubble gum and uh, rubbing all that other stuff. How is everybody? Good? Good. One dude said he was okay, and that's fine. Um, it has been one of those weeks where you're like, tiring. Has anybody else had a tiring week? Okay, good. Because it's been one of those weeks, and I've been praying, Lord, what exactly do you want me to say? And, and God has just put some really cool things on my heart because, church, listen, when Pastor and I get up here, I, and it's our prayer, both of our prayers, that we don't want to say what we want to say. We want to say what God wants us to say. We really want to bring something that comes from the Lord. And, I was, and as, a, as I was praying about this, just certain little things have been happening in my life and certain little things have been happening in, around me that I'm like, okay, God, I, I just feel like this is what you really want to preach to your people this morning. And as you sit there, I want you to say, Lord, what can I take away from it this morning? What can I get out of it this morning? Some of us come to church and we say, I want to go sing the songs. No, it's not about the songs. Songs are really cool. It's not about who's preaching or, or what they're saying. It's about what God wants to do in our lives. Amen? It's about what the Holy Spirit has for us when we come into this place. And that's what I'm praying, that God would just do something awesome in your life this morning. We've been on this path of, of focusing on God, what it means to focus on God. And, and that first week was ab about a clear vision, what, what a clear vision for 2020 is. You know what, church? January is almost over. We get one more week. That's how fast time flies. Are you making the most of it? And then that remaining in Jesus the, the week after that, and, and Brother Lyon spoke about getting rid of distractions, and, and I wasn't here last week, but intentional creating good and healthy habits. And, and today is going to be about knowing what is important to God. Because if you know what's important to God, you can put those things into play. You can use those things. If we don't know what's important, we don't know what to do, right? We need to know what is important to God and then put some of those things into play. It'll be up on the screen, but if you want to turn to your Bibles, it's John chapter 14, verse 6. John chapter 14, verse 6. I'll let you get there for a moment. John chapter 14, verse 6 says this. I, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the what? The life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, listen to this, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you know him, and you have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough. Philip wanted that proof. Philip said, you know what? If you're the Son of God, show us who the Father, Father is. He wanted that, that living proof, and, and Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say to us, show us the Father? Listen to this, verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And 14 is one of my favorite verses. If you ask, any, ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Now, anything according to God's will, God's going to do it. And as I re read this passage, it, it, it opens up my eyes to, I may never have seen God. No one has seen God. God is spirit. No one has really seen God. But we have seen Jesus, and we have read about Jesus, and we know who Jesus is. And if I can follow Jesus, I am following who? I am following God. Amen? So I need to know what God is about. I need to know what Jesus is about. And as I, as I know those things, I am following him. I lived in, in uh, Deb and I lived in Washington for four years while I went to college. Northwest Bible College, which is now Northwest University, up in Kirkland, Washington. And uh, being married, I, I needed a job. So I, I found this job for a guy, and I wish I could remember his last name. His first name was Art. He was a motivational speaker. And so he would travel the world speaking in front of people, like car companies, Chrysler. He would be in front of Microsoft, who was just starting at the time. All these different huge, huge companies he was uh, uh, speaking in front of. Well, he was not in charge of me. His wife was in charge of me. And so I interviewed for the job, and she was a little shaky. Uh, not the nicest person in the world, but I'm like, okay, I can do this. I was 25, 26, a long time ago. I was like, okay, I could, I could get through this. She's all right. So 
she had an Apple computer like when Apple was just starting out. And there was all these things on the screen. I didn't know what those things were. Now we're familiar with Windows and we know all those things. I had no idea. She expected me from like day one to know what everything was. I, I was so confused. I, it was the scariest thing ever. She would come down and be like, Rocky, why is this message all not right? What are you doing wrong? I don't know what you want, I kept telling her, you know, in a nice way. I was like, if you show me what you want, I can do it. I, I could learn. I promise you, I could learn. And it was the most difficult thing to try to figure out what, she's, what she wanted. Have you ever worked for somebody like that, that you tried and tried and tried, and you can't figure out what they wanted? I worked for another person like a couple years after that. It was the same way. And I always thought to myself, your husband is a motivational speaker. And I feel so defeated every time I come down to this basement. What's going on? Why, why are you making me feel so defeated? So I can't remember how long that lasted. That lasted probably about eight or nine weeks. And I was like, okay, I'm done with this job. I went through the Navy for six years and I couldn't deal with this one female lady. She was just driving me crazy. So I had to look for another job. And I found a job at Pastewell. And uh, this was a fun job. At Pastewell, we made, they could, listen to this, we made wallpaper pasting machines. Raise your hand if you knew there was a wallpaper pasting machine. All right, one guy in the back knew there was a wallpaper. A couple guys knew there was a wallpaper pasting machine. And I didn't know this, but I went there and I started working. And guess what I did? I didn't try to figure out the job on my own. I tried to understand John, who I was working with. I, was try I tried to understand what he wanted. So as I'm drilling those holes, man, that's all I did is drill holes all day long on this little piece of wood and, and, and put the little bolts in there. And that's all I was doing. I was doing all the manual labor. But all along, I was saying, hey, am I doing it right? Am I figuring it out? How's your family? I found out he was a... a uh, uh, this might sound bad. He was like a minor Christian. You know what that is? I go to church every once in a while and I know who God is, but I'm not really committed to the church anymore. That type of person. But it was my job to try to help him, to motivate him. So now I'm, I'm doing all these screws. Eventually he goes rocky. And, and I'm from Ohio and my dad loved construction, but I didn't love construction. He said, would you like to start cutting wood? And I was like, no, I don't want to get a big table saw. I'm like, no, a little bit scary. But I did. I started cutting the wood and, and I'm getting better at cutting the wood and, and sanding all this stuff down. Eventually, and you're going to be very proud of me, I was the sole builder of the Pastewell wallpaper pasting machines. I should get a hand for that because you guys never did that. I was the sole... I'm just teasing, but you guys, are, you guys are great. I was the main builder. Why? Because I learned a little bit about him. I learned a little bit about what he was doing. And I, and I liked him, and we worked well together. When I figured out what he wanted, guess what? My life and his life was so much better. And, I, and, and making those machines, they had to be so precise. And I always thought... I wonder if there's a contractor out there right now pulling that wallpaper through and saying, man, who made this machine? This machine is terrible. It's not even really lined up really well. That was my job, though. I, I love that job. And then I went on to a bunch of other stuff. But here's what I learned. You can't serve well unless you figure out what the person wants. You can't, you should write that down. You can't serve well until you figure out what the person wants, right? I needed to figure out what they wanted. Now my boss is now, man, I am there for them. I try to find out everything that they want. And guess what? The Lord has been promoting me because I find out what people want. And more importantly, I found out what God wants. And then I do what he wants. And it's amazing how life works in that way. And so today as you're sitting there saying, thinking about this, saying, God, who are you? What do you want for my life? And what do you want me to do? The first thing we find out from that passage is very important. He says this, I am the way, the truth, and everybody say it, the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I don't know how you came here today, but it was not by accident. I think Annalisa said this. This is an appointment from God for you to be here today. And I don't know if you're a believer. I don't know if you've committed your life to Christ, and I pray before you leave this place that you would. Nothing else matters, church. I don't care about your job. I don't care about your money you make. I don't care about what kind of house you live in. I don't care about any of that stuff. You seem cold, Rock. No. All that matters is your relationship with Christ. And I'm going to end today. Yeah, we can give the Lord a clap off. All that matters is your relationship with Christ. There is no other way. If there was another way, Jesus would not have to go to the cross. Amen? There is no other way. He is what? Say it with me. The only way. Well, 
come on, there's got to be another religion, all I Buddha and all this other stuff. No. God is the only way. I teach middle school science. So please pray for me. But um, there, there's a kid, in, he's an eighth grader. No, he's only a seventh grader, so I get to have him one more year, Sister Annalisa. Praise the Lord, yay. Uh, he comes in every day and drives me crazy. DeAndre, pray for DeAndre. I would love for DeAndre to be listening to this. That would be wonderful. He comes in every day. There is no God. There is no God. There is no God. But all I hear is Jesus and they, you know, Jesus Christ. Those things, I come out of his mouth. And I'm like, if you don't believe in God, don't talk to him then. DeAndre, why don't you say Buddha or Muhammad? If you, but if you don't believe in God, stop mocking my God. But what are you talking? I said, you tell me every day that he, there is no God and I listen to you. I don't judge you. But then you come in here and say, God this and God that. If you don't believe in somebody, why are you saying it? He looks at me like, can you talk to me like that? I can talk however you want. Stop, it's my classroom. Stop talking about God. Stop talking about him. That, see, people don't believe. Now, for DeAndre, who knows? Someday he's going to have to come down and bow before him. And man, guess what? He's going to find out that there is a God. I, I'm not happy about that. Jesus says, don't be happy if somebody doesn't know the Lord and they pass on. I want everybody to find Christ. But Jesus made it very clear, there is no other way. And why would I start with that? Because if you want to know who God is, God is all that there is, and he wants us to follow him, but he wants others to come in to the kingdom of God also. You have a, you have a uh, plan for your life, and you have a mission, and we are really passionate about, about this mission these next couple of years to see God do something wonderful, not only in this church, but throughout this community. I love the fact right now, as I look out there, there's not that many seats. Praise the Lord. I would love the fact if Joe back there has to put out more seats because you're bringing so many people to church because they need Christ. Is Jesus one way? Say no, no. He is the only way. Say it again. He is the only way. There is no other way to heaven but by him. You still don't believe it, some of you. Thank you, Paul. Paul believes it. I'll tell you what, until you, until you really get that into your spirit, you will not help anybody because you're like, well, maybe there's another way and I don't need to help them because they're going to find Christ anyway. No, you're it. Tag, you're it. You get to go help them. You get to go minister to them. You get to dive into their lives. So Jesus Christ is the only way. Secondly, Jesus is very relational. He was in the, he, he was in the people building business. He loved people. And if Jesus was in the people building business, guess what? You need to be in the people building business. I know that there are a lot of people sitting out there today. Don't raise your hand or don't nudge your neighbor because you know this is true. I know there's a lot of people sitting out there today. You don't really like to be around people. You don't like to be around people. And, and you'll say things like, well, Pastor Rocky, I'm an introvert. I'm an introvert, so I like to be all by myself. And I, I don't really want to talk to people. I have a question for you. How can you minister, listen to this, how can you minister to people that you don't even like, that you don't want to build a relationship with? Amen? You have to like people. I love my youth group, and they're all sitting in the back. Look, they're all back there. Don't look back there. They're going to be all embarrassed now. Don't look back there. Maybe we should all look back there. They would tell me things like, well, I don't really like that group at school. I don't really like, I'm like, guys, how are we going to get bigger if you don't like people? You have to like people. You don't, I didn't tell you you have to hang out with them and have Easter dinner and Christmas dinner over there, but you have to like people. Jesus was very relational. He went out of his way to minister. I just read it this week where he, he called Matthew, and Matthew was a what? A tax collector. And he said, hey, Matthew, I'm going to come eat at your house. Why? Because I want food, but I also want a relationship with you and all of your sinner buddies. Because even the disciples says, how does he go hang with those people? They're sinners. And I, I, it would have been fun if the Bible says, Jesus, the disciple says, hey, why don't you come join her? And there'd be one more sinner and you could be all, we could all be together, right? Because we're all sinners. You have to build relationships with people. In my school, Debbie will tell you, I am purposely trying to build relationships with some people to help them find Christ. I, I love them to death. I don't want to go to any of their parties. 
because I don't drink. I don't need to. I'll invite them over to my house. We'll go over to their house. And I love when they, when they invite me over, Rocky, we have the LaCroix or we have some water, <laughs> you know, because they're drinking, but they don't care. I, I'm trying to build a relationship with them. So I'm going to go. I don't necessarily like anything. I don't like all their stuff, especially since there's some 49er fans in the bunch. I don't really like them. <laughs> there's my buddy Paul back there and Jerry Lynn, who are so-called, no, Paul is, but everybody, you know, Everybody's a 49er fan this year. Come on, Cowboys, next year. We got this. Just teasing, just teasing. It's a pipe dream. So I build relationships because I want to get in their lives the same way with my referee friends. I will never be like them because I don't drink and I don't swear and I, I don't do those things. And, and, but I want to build relationships so that someday maybe they could come to know the Lord. And I'm going to wrap that part up in, at the end of the message in a little bit. So Jesus built relationships. The next thing about Jesus, he was obedient and very consistent. It cannot be said about your life that this person is very obedient. They, they, they listen to the word of God. They even listen to their bosses. They listen to the people. They're very obedient. Turn to Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Bring your Bibles to church, even though we put it on the wall, on the, on the screen Remember the wall back on the, you had the little overhead projector with the little plastic things? I've been in church a long time. Uh, obedience and consistency. Matthew 28, verse 19. And you've heard this. If you haven't heard it, this will be the first time. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Say go. Go. Say it again. Go. So now you said it, so you have to do it. And make disciples, not converts. We are working hard to figure out how to help people grow into discipleship and become more like Christ because we don't want babies. The church is really good at making babies. Can you raise your hand, accept Christ, and then we forget about them, right? That's like having a baby. You bring them to the house and you forget about them. You can't forget about them. They need help, right? Babies are helpless. New believers, in a way, spiritually are helpless, and we need to help them. We need to go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're going to baptize in a couple of weeks, I think maybe even next week. And listen to this. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commandments I have given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So we are, we are implored to help people to obey the gospel of Christ, to obey the gospel message. It's not just about coming to church. Good job. You made it to church. If you go home, I used to say, I've been to some churches where listening to the pastor preach, even after a couple weeks, that people could be sitting in the pews and go home and still be abusive to their husbands or wives and not feel any conviction because no conviction was ever given from the pulpit. It was all about like 10 ways to have a happy life and 10 ways how to have raise good children, but never that you're a sinner and you need to repent of your sins and you need to change, you need to do something different. That's what obedience is. Obedience is knowing what the Bible says and doing what the Bible says. Well, it's only when people are watching, right? No, all the time. You can't live one life here and then go home and live another life. We call that hypocrites. That's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to find what Christ wants and then obey that word. Obey that. Obey the teaching. We'll go back to relationships. If I have a relationship with somebody and all I'm doing is swearing all day long and talking bad about people and I'm a drunk and I go see movies that I shouldn't see and I'm watching things on the internet that I shouldn't be watching and then I say, hey, would you like to come to church? They're going to be like, why? You're the same as me. Why should I come to church? But when I'm obeying Christ, not in a weird way, not in a Bible thumping over your head, but when I obey Christ, they see that and they're like, hey, something different in your life. I want to go, I want to, I want to see what's different in your life. A teacher came up to me just on Friday and she goes, isn't this weird, Rocky? She, well, there's a couple other teachers. She goes, somebody came up to me. Another teacher came up to me the other day and told me, um, why are you always depressed? Like you, you, this other teacher came to this teacher who was talking to me and said, you always look like you're depressed. You always look like you're sad. And she was taken back. She goes, 
uh, I, you know, is that me? I'm like, I don't want to be honest and say, yeah, no. Uh, sometimes, sometimes she is a little down, but overall she's fine. I don't know why this other teacher wanted to tell her that, but she was taken back by that. You know what I like to hear? I don't hear it all the time, but I like to hear. Rocky, you always seem to have a smile on your face. Rocky, you always seem to be in a good mood. I'm not always in a good mood. I have 126 graders that I have to teach every day. You come do that for a day and see if you're in a good mood. I'll take your job. You come do my job and we'll see who's in a better mood at the end of the day. They're tough. I'm not always in a good mood. But I know if I can maintain and say, Lord, you're living inside me. Let the Holy Spirit help me. It's amazing what could happen. And I'm smiling and I'm excited about it. And they notice that. Church, listen to me. People notice people notice. You can't live a life that's totally against God and say, well, maybe I could invite them to God someday. They're not going to come because they know you're a grumpy person, right? Don't be Eeyore. I said that before. You need to be like Tigger, just happy and, and jump. Not like that, but you need to be excited about life. I love Christians who are excited about life and not always depressed and down in the dumps and, and, and things like that. Hey, Knowing what God wants you to do, but not doing it is, very, is not really obedience. Knowing what God wants and doing what God wants shows our obedience. It's, it's more important to do it than, in ju than just listen to it. How many of you would not be able to get, get around unless Google Maps helps you? If Google Maps wasn't around, would you still be lost and wandering? Yes, I know, because that's me. I, I don't even know where to go anymore, but Google helps me. It really does guide me everywhere we're supposed to go. So Debbie and, and I and Rachel were going to Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. And so as we're driving down to Disneyland, we get to, we, we went a different route because we heard there's going to be some snow. So we went down I-5 and we're like, there shouldn't, or yeah, we went down I-5. We were like, no snow there, so we'd be fine. So we get to Southern California and, any, and raise your hand if you've ever heard of the grapevine. Okay, a couple of you have been on grapevine. The grapevine's in Southern California. It's usually always sunny. Not that day. This blizzard comes blowing through and stopped traffic. I-5 is just stopped. And it says, grapevine closed. What? You can't close a road. Rachel kept saying, come on, Southern California people. We've cleared them fast up north. Clear your roads so we get through. So we sat there for probably 45 minutes saying, okay, we're here. If we go to the right, that's the coast like two hours away. If we go to the left, that is it, further into California, we need to get like in the middle and the grapevine was the middle. So we listened to Google. We just, okay, let's put Google on. And so we start following thousands of people who are trying to do the same thing. And we come to this road, it's leading us up this hill. And guess what? Roads closed. I'm like, what, what is going on? Well, let's go home because this is a miserable time to be down in Southern California. Roads closed. We listen to Google again, and he, the, she, I don't know, she or he, I don't know, what is Google? He leads us down this road, and down this other dark, like it says, turn here, and it's in the middle of this dirt road. And Debbie goes, I'm not really sure if we should be doing this right now. I'm like, honey, this is Google. Google never messes up. So we keep on going, and then we make a left, and we're in the middle of a field. I'm like... You let me down. <laughs> what are you doing? I listened to you. I followed you, and you're letting me down. <laughs> Long story even longer. We had to go probably like two hours out of our way just to get where we were trying to go. A, an eight-hour trip turned into a 16-hour trip, but we were very obedient until we couldn't be obedient anymore. We're like, okay, Google, you're whacked. You know, get out of here. Listen, sometimes, very rare, it leads us astray. But God will never lead you astray. God will never lead you astray. He always, yeah, let's clap for the Lord. He always gives you the right path. He gives you the right path. And he wants you to go down that path. It's, it's because of our hard head, and I'm Italian, so I understand that. It's because of our hard head that we want to do our thing instead of doing God's thing. And doing what God calls you to do is so much more important than, than just saying it and not doing it couple more passages. Matthew 21, verse 18. How many of you had the perfect brother or sister that could never do anything wrong? Unless they're sitting next to you. you can. Oh, just one person. All right. 
Okay, me and that person. Oh, <laughs> Andrew, my son, says his sister. All right, so you have that sister or brother that could never do anything wrong. I had that, Frank. He could never do anything wrong. And so I struggled a little bit, and I got over it. Not really, but I struggled a little bit, and I'm getting better. So I'm getting better in my life. But listen to this passage, Matthew 21, verse 18. It says this. But what do you think about this? A man with two sons told the older, older boy, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. The son answered, No, I won't go. But later, he changed his mind and went. Then the father told the other son, You go, and, 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 you go. and he said, Yes, sir, I will. But he didn't go. Which of the two obeyed his father? They replied, The first. Then Jesus, ex the, and, ex then Jesus explained the meaning. I tell you the truth, correct tax collectors and prostitutes will get into the kingdom of God before you do. Listen to this. There are people sitting here today that talk a good talk, but they don't walk the walk. That is so condemning, Pastor Rocky. Why are you pointing at me? I didn't mean to. I was just pointing at it. If it felt like I was pointing at you, maybe I was. But there are a lot of people that are talking, but they're not walking. You're telling Jesus, oh yeah, I'll do it. I got it. I got this. And then you go back to your room and you're on your Xbox. The other guy says, I'm not doing it, but he goes. And Jesus is saying, I would rather have somebody that maybe though they have a, a bad attitude or maybe they say they're not, in the end, they do it. And that's who we need to be. Jesus was somebody who did it all the way to the cross. He was obedient and consistent all the way to the cross. And guess what? He wants that for all of us. He wants that for all of us. Jesus also helped people. He went out of his way to be somebody who wanted to help people. He, he had compassion. He loved them so much. He cared for them so much. It, the Bible says he would take different routes in order to help somebody out. And, and if somebody was, was, was hurting, he would help them. And he told the, the story of the good Samaritan who, who was uh, not even of the Jewish race and, or not even one of the Jewish people that were, should have been helping, but they helped. See, if you want to be somebody who knows the Lord, who loves the Lord, is following what the Lord should be doing, you should be helping people. Now, if I asked you to raise your hand, and, and I'm not going to, but there have been times where you saw the opportunity to help somebody, but you chose not to because of time or inconvenience. Let's just say amen to that, right? You chose to do something else because of time and inconvenience. The Bible is very clear where it says we need to not give up entertaining strangers because we don't know if we are helping, we might be entertaining an angel even. That is powerful. See, when I build relationships with people, when I seek to help people, when I get into their lives and I, I say, one of the worst things you can ask me or anybody else, I think, maybe you're not, don't hate this, um, can you help me move? You know, oh, that's dreadful, isn't it? Can you come help me move my boxes? Oh, no, I don't want to come. But you know what? We go and we help move and we're not grumpy, Dave. No, I'm not, the, not that Dave's grumpy, but I just said Dave. But we go, not Dave's never grumpy, but we go help them. We're excited about that. Why? Because we love people and want to help people. And especially if they don't know the Lord, we say, hey, help me, help them. Maybe some way they could come to know the Lord. Church, it's about your life. It's about their life. And if you don't do something about it, they may not get to heaven. And you are the only opportunity that they have. And what did Jesus say? I'm the only way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. And we're the ones that are supposed to give that message out. Lastly, I believe that God loves people. Can you say amen to that? God loves people. I'm going to read a couple passages from 1 John, and then I'm going to close this in prayer. 1 John 2, 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. Verse, chapter 3, verse 1 says, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. Did you know you're a child of God? Amen. I'm a child of God. I, I love my family, but I'm so much grateful, so much more grateful that God accepted me in his family. 3 is 16. This is how we know that we lo that what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay our lives down for our brothers. Back to I need to like people in order to lay my life down for them. If anyone has material possessions and sees his brother in need, but has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? 
James even says it really clear. If you have money and you have the means to help somebody, but you don't, you're worse than the world. Hey, go away and we'll pray for you when you can help them. Verse 7 of chapter 4 says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. This is all about knowing what's important to God, and love is important. Verse 10 of that same chapter says, This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but, we, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Church, all this boils down to is love one another as you love yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind and soul, but love one another as you love yourself. And I believe as we practice those things, God is gonna do something wonderful in all of our lives. I would love to say, that we have so much time to make sure that everything's right. A lot of you are sitting in here today. You might be 12, you might be 62, or older than that. And you're sitting here, I got a lot of time, Rock. I got tomorrow, life is good, I don't have to worry about that right now. I'll make all those decisions you talked about. Maybe someday down the road, life is short. Life is short. We had a referee friend who, 38 years old, with the wife, two kids, he made it through September and October of this season. One of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet. One of the, if, if niceness is anything about getting into heaven, Andrew made it. I mean, just the nicest guy you're ever going to meet. Doesn't matter to the Lord, it's, you need to know him, but just the nice guy. So he made it through October and he said uh, one day he had some stomach pains and he goes, his wife, you know, that sometimes they, men don't want to go to the doctors and uh, he went to the doctors and they said, hey, you need to go to the hospital. This is more than just a stomach pain. So he goes to the hospital and they said, we think you might have cancer. Wait, I'm 38. I'm like volunteer dad at my school type of person. I have a great job at Western Supply. He's moving up to be a Pac-12 official. The, one, the best, the cutest family and his wife is so nice. You might have cancer. You need to go to the hospital. I'm telling you, that was October 15th. That thing progressed so fast. He had a tumor on his liver. He had a tumor on his esophagus. He had a brain tumor. It hit his endocrine system, which is your, uh, with, which is your, uh, Yes, your regulatory system, your, your hormones and all that stuff. And he passed away last Sunday. 38 years old. I've known him for 12, 13 years. One of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet. And here's what I'm thinking. Did I do enough? Did I say enough? That possibly in those last couple of moments, he could have accepted Christ. I don't know if he was a believer, but I remember we drove back from California because we worked junior college and we're driving back and we're talking about, my, my daughter Rachel did the Jumpstart program for college, so he's interested in that. We're ta- he knows I'm a pastor. They all call me pastor. They all call me the minister, and, you know, they want me to pray for them, and I just said, Lord, because once he had the cancer, I had a chance to talk to him a little bit, but it went fast. I mean, from October to last weekend, it went fast, and I thought, did I say enough that maybe he accepted Christ? In church, that's how short life is. You don't know if you're going to be sitting next to your uh, husband or wife next weekend. You don't know if you're going to make it till tomorrow. And I don't want to be morbid about that, but it's the truth. And that's why when I say build relationships, love people, be obedient to the gospel, do those things that I talked about, it's important because people matter. And Andrew matters. And I don't know why he had to go through this. I miss him. I don't, like I said... I don't hang out with these people all the time. Andrew could shrink anybody under the bus. But I just pray, Lord, maybe in that last moment, he could even think, I remember what Rocky said, and accept Christ. That's a burden for me, church, because that's a friend of mine. And I want you to have that burden, too, that if I don't do everything that, they, that I can, they might not make it to heaven. And if we pray that hard, and I will tell you that story just to, 
just to push, pull your heartstring. This stuff matters to God, church. This stuff matters to God. Look at this coronavirus. How many people are dying? Things like that can happen quickly. We just don't know what tomorrow may hold. So I have two things. Accept Christ with all your heart. Live for him. Don't worry about everything else because I promise everything else will take care of itself. And care so much about people that you want them to accept Christ because you just never know what tomorrow may bring. You'd never know what, what might be coming down the pike. Let's stand on our feet this morning. If you could turn those lights off, Faith, that, or Pastor, that would be awesome. If Kaylee's here, you could come play the piano. That would be incredible. Let's close our eyes for a moment. The interesting thing about everything that we talk about in church is a decision only you could make. Uh, the Lord doesn't have any grandchildren. The Lord only has children. So you can't say, because my mom is a Christian, my mom is a believer, whatever, I'm okay. No, it's all about your decision. It's all about your life right now. So if you're here this morning and there's eyes closed all around this place. If you're here this morning and you would say, Pastor Rocky, I, I feel like it's time that I need to accept or recommit my life to the Lord. I just want you to raise your hand and we're gonna believe God for an awesome miracle this morning. You came to this place, you don't even know why you're here, but you're here and it's time for you to accept Christ. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand this morning. Thank you, sir. You can put it down. Anybody else? You're like, that's me this morning. I believe there's a couple other people. Is that you this morning? Don't hold back. You've been holding back for a long time. You've been fighting this for a long time. God wants you this morning. Let's pray this prayer. And, and let's just all pray this prayer. And if you just need it this morning, just ask God to come into your life in such a powerful way. Say, dear Lord, I haven't been living for you. Let's all say it, church. Everybody say it. It's okay. Say, dear Lord, dear Lord I haven't been living for you, but I want to start today. I commit my life to you. I want to serve you today and for the rest of my life. Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I ask this all in your precious name. Amen. 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 Can we give the Lord a clap off this morning? Amen. Amen. Um, I'm going to pray before pastor comes up and closes us. If you have a difficult time with anything that I said this morning, like the relationship, the obedience part, the loving part, the helping part, I'm just going to pray that God's going to make things smooth in your life where you're like, Pastor Rocky and Pastor Angelo, guess what happened to me this week? And some new relationships are going to spring in your life. Heavenly Father, I just pray for your people this morning that you would just give them the opportunity to live like you, Jesus, to do the things that you did. I pray that we would help people, that we would be obedient, that we would, we would care for people, that we would love people, that we would build relationships, Lord, and that we would see hearts changed and lives converted, Lord, that our baptisms would just be so awesome because so many people would be coming to know the Lord. I pray that we be a church that just cares about this community and cares about the city of Reno in such an awesome way that we would see tons of lives converted and turned over to you, Lord. I pray that you would just give us the passion, the wisdom, and the desire to do it, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and we ask our, all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Sing with me. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? sing that song cause all I want and all you are will you meet me here again oh, oh. cause all I want is all I want will you meet me here again 
Come on, sing that. Sing that again. I'm not enough unless you come. Will you meet me here again? Because all I want, because all I want is all you just want to remind you that God is just his love is so amazing it's so wide it's so high so deep and the fact that he said that he doesn't want anyone to perish but for everyone to come to know his everlasting gift and that is Jesus Christ and today we just celebrate we celebrate the fact that now we understand how to live a life focused on God. We had been talking about it for the last four or five Sundays. And today, it is very important for us to know what's important to God must be important to us. And so we just want to encourage you today to go home and really think about what we talked about today. And uh, just apply it. Knowledge is not power, but knowledge with application is power. Remember that. God bless you. Come on, give God a clap offering. Maybe seated for a moment before we let you go. Just a couple of items. So, friends, I'm, we're looking.